and to this week and last week, countries from all over the world have gathered to address probably the most critical problem we've ever had to face, and certainly the one we've able to, been able to articulate together. And, um, you know, when I was young, the environment was a marginal issue that, <clears throat> that not everyone thought was important. And now, it's everyone's main issue. There's no way you can ignore it. We have to address climate change. We're in the, we're in the middle of, or the beginning of the middle of the sixth great planetary extinction, and the first one caused by humankind. But we tonight, thanks to Maria, have a panel of experts to talk about the problems, the solutions, the problematiques, as the French would say, the enjeu sous-jacent, and uh, so we're going to learn more. And we're all learners. We're all at the beginning. We're at the beginning of the solar age, I think, I hope, and the end of the fossil fuel age. So we have to retool, change our mindsets, and learn to think anew. So tonight, um, we're going to first have uh, Jean-Marc Jankovici, the main developer of the Bilan Carbon Assessment Tool for ADEM, and the French Interministerial Greenhouse Gas Mission. He's also <coughs> the president of the SHIFT project, which you may have heard of. So, Jean-Marc, would you like to come up here? Uh, no, I'll probably stay You'll stay there. <coughs> so, good evening. Uh, I'm going to try to achieve the impossible to stick to my 10 minutes. I'm sure I'll manage it. Uh, I will try to give you a couple of figures uh, on the issue that is being tackled. I'll try to write out the project. And uh, I'll do it with a couple of drawings. This represents the fact that we, on Earth there are things that are called fossil fuels. Fossil fuels are the remains of old living organisms, uh, be it plants, coal, or be it plankton, or algae, or gas, and coal, and the oil. These fossil fuels, as all natural resources, etc., uh, as all natural resources are free. Uh, you have probably heard uh, in the green uh, language the fact that the sun is free and that the wind is free. This is true. But fossil fuels are also free. Nobody in this room paid a single cent for oil and gas to exist. Okay, so all energy is free. And actually all natural resources are free. Fossil fuels are fuel, so they burn. This combustion has enabled us to use engines and chemistry and engines and chemistry has allowed us to use more and more powerful machines ever to transform all the other natural resources that we have on Earth and manufacture all that we can think of. All the products that you have around us are just natural resources transformed by activity. And when I say by activity, it's actually by machines that we command. This is basically what you have around us. On this profusion of objects, we have designed a social system, a desirable social system, in which we have the structure of the jobs, the fact that we live in cities, the fact that we don't work all our, all our life, you know, the beginning of your life, you study and you don't work, the end of your life, you die and you don't work, you have holidays, more in France than in the US though, uh, you don't work in the weekend, etc. All this is actually a gift of energy. This is a fairy tale until you have two issues. The first one is a bottleneck on the energy supply, which has already begun to strike in Europe and in the OECD zone. Or you have an issue with the downstream of this process, which is climate change, due to the fact that you pour into the atmosphere some gases that have the property of uh, being pretty opaque to terrestrial infrared. This is what greenhouse gas do. And in between, you have the economic counterpart of that transformation, that transformation, sorry, which is called the GDP. So now you get the big picture. More GDP requires more fossil fuels, or to be more precise, when you have more fossil fuels, you have the ability to create more GDP. And the counterpart of that more GDP is that you increase climate change. 
So the solution is very easy. Decrease emissions means, and you will see at the end of this presentation, basically triggering a recession, which explains why it's pretty hard to decide by consensus of 198 countries to do so. This is a reconstruction, because of course it didn't exist before uh, the end of the Second World War, of the world GDP since the year zero. And what you can see on this graph is uh, for a couple of centuries, growth was not an issue, for it didn't exist, so there was no need to promise it uh, during the elections. Uh, actually, there were no elections, uh, which was also making the problem uh, simpler. And you didn't have any growth, so there was no point in looking for growth and saying that first you need to have growth and then you're going to solve the problems that are triggered by growth. No growth. We had other problems, but not that one. And then fossil fuels came into action and see what happens to the world GDP. Now, one question I often ask uh, to the people that listen to me, uh, what you are unhappy enough to do tonight, is who is ready to bet up to his last dollar or euro of savings into the fact that it is going to go on forever? It's a question. I hope we'll agree that it's a question. Now, just to illustrate the fact that when we discuss climate change, we are not discussing something which is marginal. And we, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do this with the US. I'm going to center the world on Europe. Uh, right? And I'm going to show you a map of Europe uh, in the present times uh, if we leave these total ecosystems uh, quiet, I would say. So if we don't get rid of the forests, to install schools, roads, cathedrals, especially uh, that of Paris, or, or other things. This is what we can find in Europe today. We find basically forests, which means that the weather is mild enough and wet enough so that we can have big plants okay, and the animals that go with it. Far up north here, it's too cold and too dry to have forests, and here it's too dry to have forests. We basically have them all around. Sorry, I didn't appear in the good order. Uh, I'm sorry, the animation did not go right. Anyway, on the left, you have Europe uh, 20,000 years ago. 20,000 years ago, we're in the middle, or actually, we're at the maximum of the last ice age. So men run after mammoths, whenever they can find some. And this is the global picture of Europe. The coastline is, going, is, is here. So you see, it's outside UK, outside uh, Scandinavia, etc. Actually, Scandinavians do not exist, uh, so it's impossible to have Finnish or Swedish students in U.S. universities. There are no Swedes and uh, nobody in Finland, because everybody is under three kilometers of ice, which, by the way, is the same for Canadians. You have a huge ice cap on Canada, uh, which is uh, the Ronty ice cap, uh, which is covering the whole country. Good news for those that love rugby, uh, no need to be afraid of Scots, uh, who are also on the ice. <laughs> Bad news for those that are sailing in the channel, no channel, uh, because the sea is 120 meters lower. And all the water which is not in the sea anymore has constituted these large ice caps that you have in Scandinavia and Canada. Installed ecosystems in France resemble to those of northern Siberia today, basically. And this enables France to feed something like 100,000 people. So you take a little part of Paris, an even smaller part of New York, and that's all you can feed in France at the time. Well, the average Earth temperature between these two pictures is 5 degrees. So when the last ice age ended, the Earth temperature warmed by 5 degrees in something like 5,000 years. And you can see the result on these two maps. Now, the conclusion to which I'm going to lead you is that if we get a couple of degrees in a century, in a world that will be some time over this century be progressively deprived of fossil fuels, we will basically get war everywhere. That is basically what we're doing. So when we say that mitigating climate change is an issue, it's not an issue because it's going to harm a little, you know, your bottom line on your balance sheet. It's an issue because we are playing with peace and war, we are playing with the life expectancy, and we are playing with the size of the population. This is basically what we are playing with. So it's not something marginal. And because we are playing with such issues, of course, uh, solving the issue seems to be a good idea. But with what I've just explained before, 
It's not going to be something which is painless in the sense that we can solve that issue and keep all the rest. We're at the time of making choices. This is what I think about. Now, if we don't want, uh, this is a straight line, a very important straight line. This diagram taken from the last IPCC report gives on the, use the upper horizontal axis. On this axis, choose a number which represents the cumulated emissions of humanity from the beginning of the industrial age until a given time. So let's say that we are in 2015, and the number that we will choose is 2000, because in 2015, humanity has emitted 2000 gigatons of CO2 equivalent since the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. Now you take that line across this curve, and that enables you to get the average temperature increase that we will get in 2100 compared to pre-industrial era, plus or minus, of course, a margin of error that you can see here. If we play the game the other way around, and we say that we want to stick to the, to the objective of two degrees, it means that we cannot emit more in cumulated emissions until 2100 than 3,000 gigatons of CO2 equivalent, which, in other words, means that we take what we've already emitted so far, divide it by two, and it's all we can emit until the end of this century. If we don't do this, we'll go over two degrees. In a couple of slides, I'll show you where the emissions come from, and you'll understand. This, this relates to something you might have heard of, which is the concept of stranded assets. Here you have the CO2 equivalent, or the CO2 potential, uh, to be more precise, of the proven reserves of fossil fuels we have today. And it's broken down, it's broken down sorry, uh, in coal, oil, and gas. What you can see on this slide is like, for example, in the Seoul Asia Pacific region for the Seoul coal, you already have enough to get to the two degrees. So if our friends there use this, all the rest must stay under the ground. So basically, this issue is about sharing something which is going to be, become, to become scars. Where do emissions come from? Uh, this, I'm sorry, I made to take comments. Uh, this pie chart, of course, you don't have the legend, uh, you're going to have it progressively, is the breakdown of the world emissions. 20% of the world emissions come from coal-fired power plants. If we are serious about the two degrees, we must get rid of all these coal-fired power plants. I say all in the 30 years to come. By the way, I'm not ready to bet a single euro on the fact that we'll get there only with photovoltaics and wind. Not a single second do I believe this. 6% come from gas and oil uh, power plants. 5% come from cement. 10% from the rest of the industry, so the cement industry is something which is huge in the industry total. 6% come from boilers of buildings, not the electricity used, only boilers. 30% come, uh, 13, sorry, percent come from transportation, 4 from car, 4 from trucks, 3 from uh, marine shipping, and 2 from planes. 20% come from eating, and among eating, cattle is the main source. If you take both the emissions of cattle and the emissions of the crops that you need to grow to feed uh, the cattle. 8% comes from deforestation, which is generally an upstream, uh, well, it's the upstream process of uh, putting forests, uh, turning forests, sorry, into uh, fields. And this comes from the rest. I'm going to finish with a rule of three, sorry, because this is the main rule of three that you must have in mind. CO2 emissions in the world are equal to themselves. This we should agree on. I will divide by the energy we use in the world and multiply, of course, you know that I can do this. This term is the CO2 content of the energy we use. It goes down when we use renewable nuclear, goes up when we use coal instead of anything else. Divide it and, I'll divide and multiply by the GDP. So this is the energy consent of the GDP. Basically, it means I transform the environment up to one joule, how many dollars I get for that. And then I multiply and divide by the population. So what I just said is that the CO2 emissions in the world are equal to the product of four terms. Obviously, the more we are, the more we emit. The more we consume, the more we emit. The more we use energy to get a given service or product, and the more we emit. And the more we use fossil fuel instead of anything else, and the more we emit. 
This has to be divided by 3 until 250 if we want the 2 degrees. And because of simple maths, if we wait long enough, anyway, it will happen. Because fossil fuels are finite and we just can't have ever rising fossil fuel use on Earth. The first simple solution would be to divide the population by 3. Uh, I don't find many supporters of that idea. Uh, but it's a way to get the math done. So don't forget that if nothing yet works, when we will have a decrease on the CO2 emissions, it is going to be one of the ways to get that decrease on the CO2 emissions. Another way, of course, would be to decrease the GDP per capita. But generally, it's not the way it's put. When you look at the draft of the agreement, of the Paris Agreement that I just looked at this afternoon, it says, first, we must have sustainable development, and then we must reduce emissions. So if you read between the lines, it means, first, we need GDP growth, and then we'll see. If we get a population increase and the GDP increase everybody is dreaming of, these two terms are roughly multiplied by three, which means that we engineers are in charge of getting a division by roughly 10 of these two terms, for that you consumers and you politicians can go on promising growth and having everything and dream of at the local supermarket. That's a nice task for us. The first thing you can do is, of course, achieve an increase in the energy or progress in the energy intensity of the economy. I would like to point that since the rise of internet, this term has stopped to improve. I don't say that it's because of, I just point that the rise of information technologies has gone along with the fact that this term has stopped to improve. It just happened at the same time. Okay? Which demonstrates at least one thing, which is you can't say because of IT is going to go better on that aspect. It's the only thing you can't say. And uh, the CO2 content of the energy is also something that has stopped to improve in the last 15 years, that is, when the tremendous investments into renewables began. So when you do a little fact-checking, what you can see is that we are not at all set so that this is going to solve this part of the problem. And if I have one bet, one sad bet to make, is that today we are taking all the changes so that the problem one day finds a solution through this.